Welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington, and my great partner, Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Oh, hi, Tom. I feel like we're being truly global today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to, to, to introduce Zaretta Hammond. Uh, welcome to our podcast, Zaretta. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so well, we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of things. And the, the reason why I, I wanted to get you on so so soon after seeing you talk was because it was, you just made a massive impression on me. So I'll, I'm going to tell people a little bit about that. And this was at the um, the instructional coaching group that, that Jim Knight runs. He does an annual conference. And I was invited to go and do a talk with Oliver Caviglioli. And we went along. It was really exciting that the TLC, it's called Teaching and Learning Conference, and the standout highlight, like without any shadow of a doubt, was uh, Zaretta's talk. Was your was your was your keynote? It was just, it was just so inspiring. And I I I'd, I'd sort of was aware of you on on Twitter, and I, and I've been following you. But hearing you speak was just so uh, amazing. And I, I just thought, oh wow, what the message you're giving and the, the ideas that you have. So I thought, wow, we've got to share this. So that was the reason why I came to you and I, on Twitter you're known as ready for rigor which I think is out, absolutely outstanding and uh, so let's let's that's my introduction to you so let, tell people a bit about yourself as director for people who might not know what you do yeah I am a a longtime educator uh I call myself a boots on the ground uh, teacher, even though I've been out of the classroom for a while. And um, I've been in education about 30 years. I was a, a writing teacher when I was in the classroom back in the day, in the uh, mid to late 90s. And got, um, you know, I, I really started to wonder why my students weren't progressing as writers. And I took the stance of inquiry and took the stance of experimentation through the lens of what we now are calling culturally responsive education. How do I leverage what my students already know and can do because their brains are learning machines and, be, and, and exploit that in a good way to get them to think about their learning moves and change them. What, what, what does it take for us to shift the cognitive load to get the student to be not only metacognitive, but metastrategic in terms of changing their moves? Uh, and I learned a thing or two and it progressed and I saw my students make progress, high school and uh, community college, first two years of university students. And um, that set me on a trajectory to really want to know more about cognitive neuroscience, social neuroscience through this lens of equity. How do we serve students who have historically been marginalized to help them regain not just confidence, but to build their cognitive muscles? That's why my framework that I integrated into my book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, is called Ready for Rigor. How do we get students ready for rigor? So, all of that uh, kind of set me down a path. And then I got called out of the classroom to support teachers as part of a departmental curriculum design work and that progressed. And so for the past 25 years, I've been coaching teachers and teams and school leaders around how do we bring the science of learning to uh, bear on the question of equitable education for students who have been historically marginalized. and here's the thing to remember, wherever we are in the globe, wherever colonization has happened, we have this problem because one of the key things that happened as part of colonization was the weaponizing of the science of learning to underdevelop reading skills, to downgrade the educational experience, to um, promote the narrative that dark-skinned people uh, are not uh, intelligent. So it goes that we have to not just reverse those in terms of mindset, but we have to reclaim and rebuild that uh, uh, rigorous classroom for the students. Because we see out in the world, they are just 
creative, curious learning machines. And we just have to make classrooms more hospitable to learning. That, this, is that... What, this is what I love then. So this is this is the thing to me where I feel like, I mean, yes. to me, you're a standout voice in this area, which is you're, you're talking about equity issues. But then you bring, but you bring it down to classrooms being rigorous places where you're being demanding of students and making them. And I love the word rigor. So it resonates with me partly because back, you know, 10 years ago or so, ago, I started writing a blog uh, and I'm still doing it now. But the, one of my very first ones was a series of things about great lessons that were in school. Great lessons, one to 10. Number one was rigor. That was it. But I spell, I spell rigor with a, with a we, ha, we have a sort of stray you going in there for rigor. That's right. Things, that's right. But that was my instinct that great lessons are characteristic characterized by rigor and so i'm really interested in that word and you're ready for rigor and you've got this ready for rigor framework mm -hmm. which i'm gonna i'll flash up the book here so i bought this in orlando it's it's a great book that um cultural response teaching in the brain and right at the front you have this ready for rigor framework so do you want to just tell people a bit about that because it's really interesting yeah and i think what's so important about what you just said is yes we want rigor but what Cognitive neuroscience tells us is we uh, rigorous developmental in the sense that you have to very much like an athlete has to uh, practice and uh, expand their capacity to be able to continue to level up and reach their promise as a uh, a star athlete, right? Or to get to their prime, and, and that's the same thing with our students. So what I see too often is teachers say, yes, I want rigor. So we just put rigorous lessons in, but we haven't prepared the student. We haven't gotten them ready to take on rigor. And if they are students who are failing or struggling, then what we know from social neuroscience is it starts to toggle their defense mechanisms. I call it in the book, the amygdala hijack. And that is not, you know, me making something up. This comes from psychology and social neuroscience. And the ready for rigor frame tries to bring those things together in a way that's understandable and actionable for teachers. So there are four quadrants. The first is just awareness, not just awareness of racism in the world or, you know, colonization in the world, but it's just awareness of who you are, what your learning experiences are. So when we say, you know, I hold high expectations, are you doing it because you think you can or because of your positionality, you were able to do it? Do you understand the context? So that's awareness. Then there's learning partnerships. Students don't learn from people they don't trust. So you have to build a trusting relationship. And that is rapport, building that sense of friendliness and connection. We call that personal warmth in the research. Then you have to build a, a uh, alliance. This is where we're going to get to work. We're rolling up our sleeves. I'm going to be your coach. And, you know, because we have this trust, you're going to trust me to get you into your zone of uh, proximal development, right? The learning edge. And for a lot of students, that triggers some, you know, emotions and, fears and other things. So being able to coach that student through that as well as coach them through learning. Then we get to information processing, right? It's something we don't talk about in education, but it's the, the key thing that's happening in the brain. So I want to help educators kind of reclaim their understanding of how the brain works and how to help students process information. So new learning always has to be coupled with existing learning, the students' funds of knowledge, what they their background knowledge or what we, you know, whatever we want to call that. But they come in knowing something. This is schema building. And the fourth quadrant really puts us in uh the environment. What does it, it look like to have a community of learners, not just a fun classroom, but where all kids know they're leaning into this idea of being expert learners, very much like you might have scientists. When they're in the lab, we're all up to being scientists, right? A basketball team, we're all up to being athletes and we know our roles and we're leaning in and leaning on each other. We don't do that in classrooms. Instead, we have a pedagogy of compliance. So this ready for rigor frame is how do we help teachers begin to bridge and leaders understand what they need to do to create the environment, to bridge from this pedagogy of compliance where we want students to 
talk when I say talk, uh, uh, do this assignment, things are over scaffold. So the joy and the curiosity is not there that actually toggles the brain. Wow, that's great. I mean, I, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's funny because we're talking, you know, most of the people listening will be on, on a audio um, and I could I could hold it up to the screen, but it's, it's really thorough. And I love, I, I'm a sucker for a framework because I just think you having do. ideas is, you know, the, it, it can be quite nebulous and you turn it into this sort of like progression and it does start with the awareness and you're thinking, because to be honest with you, when I first came across the phrase culturally responsive, I was thinking, what, is it, what does it look like in practice? You know, and you, you kind of lay it out there. And I love that accumulation of the awareness. Then you've got the partnership building. Yeah, I love that idea that we try to, we have to bond with our students to a point where they come on so that I can push them. Then the information processing. And finally, this, this culture, this community of learners, because we, we're not teaching the children, the students by themselves. It's just, it's, it's really really brilliant so is that something is that the thing that you have you have that for a long time or is it something you've come to it more recently that that, that the four quadrants? oh no i when i came out of the classroom and i was being asked to coach teachers and um i said how do i help teachers really understand what needs to happen what i saw in terms of what i did for my writing students i needed to help them and what i realized is oh they weren't getting that training and professional learning in um, cognitive neuroscience. That just happened to be what I, as a self-directed learner, was educating myself about. And, you know, I call it, and I tell my teachers and, you know, students, assign yourself. You know, the reality is if we're going to actually expand, you're not going to get this in the PD that your school sets up. So I started coaching teachers this way. And every every few years, I'd have a group of teachers kind of, you know, come up on me and say, you need to write this down. I'm like, we got work to do. <laughs> Let's get back at it. And, uh, you know, they would every year they'd get a little more aggressive in that, a different group of teachers. And finally, I just said, all right, all right, all right, I'll write it down. But the first I was cleaning out uh, some files and came across the very first version, which was 2003. Right. And I'd written a book, a paper, a white paper for the Oakland Unified School District in Northern California that uh, had the core concepts in it. And that was uh, uh, 2001. So I had actually been using this. And again, because those teachers were so aggressive in a loving way, uh, <laughs> I, I just committed it, wrote it. And then I said, let's get back at it. And now, you know, the book has taken on a life of its own because uh, I think the the concepts resonate and the practices. I am always a person that is really about conceptual understanding and practice. That's not theory. This is not theory. These are things that are proven, but how do we bring them so that we understand and then can take informed action? Teachers have a tendency to want, just give me the strategy. Well, not everything starts with just doing the strategy. Like this is, you know, charm, class at Hogwarts. That's not what this is. <laughs> you really do have to understand how a thing works, right? Deconstruct so you can reconstruct. That's great. I knew the book ends, goes towards that. So Emma, we, 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 what, what, what's you been your, you, you, we've been doing our research on Zaretta's oeuvre. So what, what, what have you, <laughs> what struck out for you? Well, I first came across your work, Zaretta, when Tom sent me a very, very enthusiastic DM. I mean, just, about, I've just seen this lady speaking. She's amazing. And we've got to have her on the podcast! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Um, so I started to kind of read a, a, around your work, and like Tom, fell deeply in thrall uh, to it. Um, what I want to kind of unpick, though, because you talk about those quadrants, was I was reading some of your writing on the blog, and I really what landed was this idea about the difference between kind of shallow or surface culture and this deep culture bit. And I read it and I just thought, oh, <laughs> wow. And I've not stopped thinking about it ever since. So I'd rather than me fumble my way through trying to explain it secondhand, I'd really like you to kind of expand on that idea in the blog about challenging the culture that all of this sits within. Yeah, I think that word, culture has so many meanings to it you know the culture of an organization that's a type of culture how people come together then there are the cultures that we um 
uh, find in life because they are like-minded. There's affinity with people, right? Parents of toddlers come together because <laughs> Lord knows we need support when our babies are young. And, you know, we bond for a time. Once they're older, we probably disperse in terms of that, the culture, that group. But then there's the culture that we are born into, that we are socialized into from zero to usually seven before we're off to formal school, but it never goes away. And it is how our brain wires itself, right? Our brains are the hardware, culture is the software. It's our operating program. How close is it okay to stand to you? How close, you know, how loud do we get to talk before you start to think someone's rude? This is what shallow culture is. So some people might hear shallow culture and think, oh, that's a thing I don't want. No, that's what's just under the surface. That's how we're using the word shallow culture, just under the surface. These are the hidden, unwritten rules that nobody gives you a rule book, but you learn. Like if I were to come over to England as an American, I have to pay attention because there's some things we do here that might might be considered rude or inappropriate. And I have to pay attention to get into flow and to be in rapport with people. This is where that learning partnership piece comes together. The piece we do want to stay away from, because there are actually three parts of that kind of nurture culture that I talk about wires the brain, and that is surface culture. And a lot of times when we're talking about culturally responsive, it's the performative surface culture. If I just have posters of diverse people, or if I just celebrate your holiday, uh, if I just make it multicultural, it's a small world, it's very performative. You haven't changed anything. You haven't paid attention to what triggers my fear response or what pulls me into the relationship because it triggers my bonding response. That's what shallow culture is. Deep culture is the values we hold, the mind, the mental models. This is the, the core of our schema. So those two, shallow and deep culture, are deeply important. And they are the ones most educators don't have the opportunity to really get to know. All education is culturally responsive. The question is to whose culture is it responding? And most students who are diverse, different by language, race, ethnicity, have to adhere to a Eurocentric individualistic culture. And they learn to do that, but it's typically not the other way around. So what culturally responsive teaching says is that any teacher in this global world, in this, you know, we have no borders anymore. You have to expand your capacity for moving up and down between and across cultures. And if you don't have that, you think everybody's just gonna to adhere to your culture, then you're not gonna create the kind of classroom where brains feel safe and can be calm and ready. That really landed when, when I was reading it. Cause I just, I was talking to someone about this today. I'd just been to a conference, which was a leadership conference. And there was a speaker there who was an international, um, kind of national level rugby coach and he'd been working with teams all around the world and he was coaching the all blacks in new zealand the, the new zealand all blacks team and every morning they would pick up a sheet which critiqued their um performance the day before and it would list everything they did right and everything they did wrong and everybody had sight of it and what he hadn't realized that was that for the players who were maori that was enormously um a kind of upsetting because it it was a, a group shaming almost which in their particular culture was just completely the opposite of how they addressed a problem or tackled a challenge and this coach was talking about how they then changed the way that they coached the entire team and approached developmental processes based on what the married players told the coach and I went to that leadership conference and then I read your writing I was thinking this is the most serendipitous <laughs> couple of days that I've had because it's all kind of falling into place and echoing around what I'm listening to and what I said to Tom was I don't know whether that's um, a resonance whether it's right whether it's an example but there was definitely a link for me in my learning about responding to different people with different lived experiences and coming at yeah. things from a different angle. 
I so appreciate that. And the reason it is serendipitous and resonance because it is the core of social you know, neuroscience. And when you, it, it, what something you said that I think is so important is when the coach changed, it was good for everyone. Yeah. And this is what people have a tendency to get wrong about culturally responsive teaching, because then they say, ah, oh, I've got, you know, 19 different cultures in my class. So now I have to figure out what each one needs and serve that up. No, humans have started out as collectivists groups of human of people bonding together so when you start from that and you can integrate it because it is a continuum it's not an either or you're not pandering to anybody's culture you're actually leveraging the deepest part of our brain not only our prefrontal cortex and our executive function but our limbic system the deepest part of what makes us understand other people or connect with other people or the hair on our neck stand up when we say that person just seems off or this situation I need to leave. And there's a message your body is sending you. We call that neuroception. But when you change so that all of those parts can give you information and aid in your learning, then it's resonant for all humans. So this is the understanding that you're not just doing something for that culture. <laughs> you know, we ain't being paternalistic here. We're doing something that is actually leveraging science. Mm -hmm. And this is a different view of why we would want to do that. Because the reality is everybody, you know, has the experience of not wanting to know what they did wrong. But our brain has this thing called negativity bias. That the minute you tell me what I did wrong alongside what I did right, I no longer listen to what I did right. So that coach started to understand what was already culturally embedded in the Maori culture, which was negativity bias. So they understood this to say, it's not just about the shaming, it's about our, that shame comes from negativity bias. We will no, no longer pay attention to what's positive. And we will start to internalize like, ah, oh, I can't do it. This is bad. And so we set ourselves up for now having to reverse that when we want students' brains to be open to learning. So I think that's why it's resonating with you. And it's so exciting. Like that's just one piece. We could go down that rabbit hole, right? <laughs> so I so appreciate that. And it's like a little shift that a teacher could do. Little shift that this coach did that started mm -hmm. to make a difference. I was on... Uh, Twitter last night. Do we call it X now? I don't even know what we call it, but I was on there and, you know, just checking and had some notification. And one was a teacher. I don't know who this teacher was, but I guess she just felt compelled to post because she said um, she tried something out of the book in which I suggest as part of an extension of your learning partnership with your student. That's why learning is at the front that you ask the students, what did they learn today, right? So it's not just here's a exit ticket or we're going to do a review, but literally creating a little space to have people just step back, right? Just to have your students step back and ask, what did you learn? What was confusing? Uh, how did you get out of that confusion? And she obviously tried it a couple of times. <laughs> and the biggest part of the post was it worked. <laughs> it's like, right, yeah, yeah. right? And it works when we work it. Not if we think it's something magical. She trusted her students. She created space. So now you have to have time, right? She tried it out. She gave the students voice, all right? There are all these enabling factors that you have to actually then put in place to make that thing actually happen. Uh, and of course that, you know, it's always fulfilling to, to know that, you know, these techniques stand the test of time in terms of, you know, shifting things. So very much like you said, the coach shifted. When teachers start to shift in small ways, it becomes like a lead domino, right? All these other things become possible. It's so interesting that uh, one of the things I'm, I'm interested in, I mean, again, we could talk about the, this specific thing um, endlessly because it's so, it's so interesting. It, it, and, and I know that, you know, different countries are different and there are different contexts I, I go to international schools where you 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 meet cultures where most people are kind of southeast asian or and of course in the uk i mean yesterday i was in a school in birmingham where 
probably 90% of the students were uh, Asian origin, a uh, mixture of Muslims and Sikhs, and a high, more than half the teachers were sort of non-white, and that's not typical in, in a British school. Mm-hmm. And the day before, it was sort of the opposite. It was like a, another school. like, And so you have this sort of thing of, when you talk about culture, sometimes people assume it means sort of a kind of, of a group of people, like a community. But then you fall into the thing of stereotyping and thinking, oh, because you re- you look like a certain, you come from a background of a certain kind, that means these must be your cultural things. But actually, that's, that's a huge... Um, problem isn't it if you start making assumptions without actually engaging with the students to find out kind of how they present their culture to you do, is that is that is that true do you think in the U.S. as well I think it's true in the U.S. but I also think the thing we fail to realize is that that typically happens if you are in that performative surface cultural level when mm. we talk about culture tree because then you're trying to present something Versus the coach example that was just shared, if you indeed are trying to um, uh, shift your practice where I'm not presenting anything, it's invisible to you. And Mm. what resonates is your brain says, oh, this, I understand how to, how to move through and navigate under these conditions. That's what the teacher is really trying to do. So the teacher who's worried about, do I present this? Do I do this, this element? That's a telltale sign that you're being performative. And we don't want that. That is being stereotypical. That is being, you know, in many ways, trivializing and dismissive. You can only learn if we do this versus what do most brains understand? What does learning look like in that culture that has not been uh, tainted by colonization? Because many of those countries still are under a British system of learning, which is highly competitive, focused on memorization. A lot of things are trying to shift toward creativity, natural ways of learning. But but part of what you have to understand is this is why you don't ask the students to be cultural informants for you. If you're really wanting to do that, then you're understanding going into the community. You position yourself as a learner in the community to start to understand, oh, this is what it means to learn in the community. The other thing I'll say quickly too is in the phrase culturally responsive teaching, we have a tendency to focus on culture and not on responsiveness. Now, it's a reason those two go together. How will you respond when the student gets stuck? Mm. And this is, or or when the student is not making progress, this is back to the coach example. He responded by giving you, I'm going to tell you what you did wrong, what you did right. He had to think about how he was responding and shift that. That is most important because now we're back to teachers and instructional decision-making choices. What will you do in that moment? This is where you will have to know and remember who is the student in front of you. Am I shaming him by doing this? Am I lifting up something he already knows? How can I activate that part of his schema? These are, you know, uh, uh, split decisions in a discretionary moment. But if you've not been practicing that, if you've not, you know, put yourself in the position to talk with other teachers or to use inquiry, then you're constantly going to fall short. So there's no part of culture that's going to help you pass underdeveloped instructional decision making that's fantastic so it was one of the slides I, I started taking notes and I just gave up so I just I took photos <laughs> of your slides because I, I was like trying to write everything down and one of them I've got it on my screen here it talks about instructional decision making micro movements and it's and basically it says there's a picture of someone choking and it's sort of saying like it's a thing that you need to respond to like now and, and you can't just sort of invent that response. Um, you've got to kind of know what to do. And I think that's interesting. So that leads itself to talking about training. I, so, I mean, this is so interesting. And I love the bit in your book where you talk about not the heroes and holidays of surface culture. And that kind of pains me that, you know, how often um, there's a brilliant woman that we've interviewed uh, who's a, a British educator called um, Benny Cara. And she she talks about the shrine to diversity in the, in the corner of the science lab, you know, it's sort of, and you do get these performative things. So I, so there's a big part of the work which is really pro- prompting people to think harder about that. I want, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the practical side of it. And one of the things I think Emma and I both sort of uh, love this was um, the sort of uh, another kind of read you have in your book, and you talk about 
something which is akin to kind of Dr. Lamov's warm strict kind of idea, which is the the warm responder. Is that is Emma? Did you picked up on that as well, didn't you? Is it it's warm a, demander? Warm, warm demander. demander. That's right. That's right. Warm demander. So yeah, tell us about because uh, that we were both saying yeah, that's that's the word. That's the word. That's that yeah. captures it brilliantly. So tell us about being a warm demander. The warm demander. There's research. That research was probably done um, probably in the 70s in uh, Alaska here in the states, and as. Uh, um, Alaska Native students were moving out of their villages into more urban areas, going to public schools that were larger, more diverse, uh, less uh, Alaska Native students, Indigenous students. Um, they were finding that in some classes they were struggling, feeling disconnected, um, and consequently not making progress. And in other classes, same student, different teacher, they were thriving. What were those teachers doing? So researchers were going in and actually understanding what they were doing. And what they were doing was this, the social warmth, and they called it personal warmth, that they knew the student, they understood, they, they, they just didn't do morning meetings and these kind of, you know, one-off activities. They got to know the student and let the student understand they knew them. I see you. Um, the student consequently built trust. Uh, the personal warmth is something you go back around to. Hey, you said your grandmother was, you know, having that knee surgery. How did that go? Right. And this might be two or three weeks later. And like, oh, you remember me telling you something personal like that. So personal warmth is that. Then there's active demandingness. This is the part that Lamov does not talk about with the warm strict. That's more of a behavior management. This is Active demandingness is the coaching part of this instructional decision making. So I want the student to move to a higher level of cognition. I want them to get deeper into their zone of proximal development. I'm going to have to draw on that personal warmth, like, you know, shovel it in like coal, because it is going to be the fuel for that student in, in terms of trust to get a little further in there right, further into that ZPD. So active demandingness is this coaching part. I'm going to help you level up. This is what I'm going to do. So I talk about it as creating a pact. What's the pact that you create with the student? I'm going to do this for you. This is how I'm going to coach you. This is what I need you to do. This is how we're going to manage, you know, I need you to manage your emotions. This is how you can do that. Here are some techniques. Now we're going to, like we're at base camp. We're about to tackle this mountain right? That's a whole different relationship. That is not what Dove Lamov in Teach Like a Champion talks about in Warm Strict. So that is the difference between those two. And I don't typically use those in the same sentence <laughs> because I do think teachers have a tendency to want to, like, I'm going to be warm and strict at the same time, right? Strict in terms of compliance versus active demandingness. I'm going to push you a little further. Let's get 1% better today. Give me two more reps on that, you know? So this is what a coach would do. And that's a very different stance. That's interesting because I, I I mean, it, it depends on your perspective and, and how you do it, I guess, because I think, I mean, because I, my my feelings about about that word strict are that it comes from the same pl the place of, as as you're suggesting, but it, it, it might not. <laughs> and, and I guess that's the problem, isn't it? Like strictness it is. that comes out of, uh, a coldness, a, a kind of lack of the opposite of warmth is. Well, is, think about it this you know, way. When you think about an individualistic culture, strict is, you know, stiff upper lip. Let's, let's, let's just get on with it. Let's push through. It's not there. It's almost emotionalist and it doesn't connote an idea of coaching. And the original research said active demandingness. It didn't say anything about strictness. So I think the, problem is the language itself because mm. it's going to toggle the mental models for a teacher about I have to not be lenient that's the opposite of strict versus what the original researchers designed which is active demandingness this is how I'm going to coach you using that personal wa the warmth and that rapport I have with you so you trust me to come further out on this learning limb 
So I, I think words matter. And therein lies the big challenge that if we were to read a book, teach like a champion, maybe, you know, someone could come to that. But if teachers in their professional learning, all they're say, hearing is warm, strict, and all it takes is one time for it to be misinterpreted. Yeah, yeah. You've got to work so hard on it. So Emma, what's your view of that? Well, I'm going to think I completely left field with this, as usual. So, because when I think of Warm Demand and Zaretta, I think of the original Mary Poppins film. And I think about Mary Poppins. So she is absolutely delightful with the children, but there is no messing about with her. And she shows people exactly what to do and how to do it and get and gets the job done. So whenever I think of, whenever I thought of like the Warm Demand rather than the Warm Strict, is that kind of no nonsense i will help you you will you know we will have this warm trusting relationship but we are going to get stuff done here and it's going to be and i'm going to help you to do that but you've got to do it yourself that's that's my interpretation of warm demand it is the original mary poppins film. absolutely that's right we can we can channel mary i i'm down with that <laughs> because what you know if we if we follow that right analogy in, in it, the idea that the whole song, right? A spoonful of sugar. And here yeah. we're not trying to sugarcoat something, but what we're yeah. trying to do is that's the personal warmth mm -hmm. is that we want to, and this is where the, it's so exciting when the science of learning, the cognitive neuroscience, this is the dopamine hit. You know, in our brains, dopamine is the thing that is our reward, cognitive reward for doing hard things. And it makes us want to do more hard things. Mm -hmm. So this is what people get wrong, right? I can kind of get you to do things in compliance and be, you know, we're going to do it. But you're not leveraging the brain science or the brain chemistry to actually help the student want to do this themselves. Because here's the thing, only the learner learns. So I don't care how strict you are or how warm demanding you are. If you can't get the learner to do a new thing and to think in a new way where they become self-directed and become self-perpetuating, not out of compliance, because the minute you stop complying, they will stop doing. Mm. And this is the challenge. Then teachers are tired because you now have to be the guard of the learning. Are you on task? Are you doing what I'm saying? And it just devolves into more compliance and monitoring and those kids versus how do we make it more joyful with that, the, the learning, but also to help kids know here are the parameters. Oh, you got to keep stretching yourself. Mm, that's good, but not good enough. Give me one more rep. And this is why we do it. And they do it with, with joy. We have to help students recover the joy of productive struggle. The oh, idea, I love you know, learning a video <laughs> game, right? Doing something new and you know you're bad at it. I call it the theory of the first pancake. You know that first pancake. <laughs> yeah. It's just messed up. Burnt and crispy on one side, gooey and beige on the other and runny. I'm like, but nobody shuts down the kitchen. Everybody laughs. The baby, the dog, the garbage gets it. And the cook adjusts. This is the part. This is back to that discretionary moment. Oh, the griddle needs to be a little hotter. Oh, I need to thin that out. The people are around talking and laughing and waiting on the good stuff to come out. That's what classrooms need to be about. But that means leaders are making sure teachers aren't getting dinged for first pancakes, that we're actually looking at innovation. We're actually saying, what did you try today or this week or this semester or quarter that didn't go well and you step back and you adjust it. How did you move out of that? So in culturally responsive teaching the brain, I have the success protocol. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it really is, what did, what did you adjust in your learning moves that got you unstuck or changed the trajectory from not knowing to, hey, I can do that now. That's what a coach does, right? When they step back and say, like, how did that game go? And at some point we'll watch the game tape, but We'll celebrate the fact that we got through the game, you know? <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, I love it. I, I've got a picture of the, the pancake slice in front of me now. It's great. Zaretta had a picture of the pan, the first pancake on there. Yes, but I but, love that metaphor. But this thing of, I mean, I do think it is a better word. I mean, it definitely is. Active, de, you know, the, the warm demander. And you have this sort of scale of active demandingness versus sort of like passive leniency. And uh, one of the things that you railed against in your, in your conference keynote was about this kind of culture of or, or sort of this niceness, this kind of patronizing niceness, which doesn't have that ready for rigor trajectory in it. Um, 
And so you have your kids, and it, you, you, it was very funny. I mean, it was kind of making sort of humor out of it, but this whole thing of like, okay, you, you've got the great rapport with your class, but your kids can't read. <laughs> so don't, it's like, so it's the kind of the intent behind it. And I love the way you've managed to fuse those two together, like that deep commitment to the students at, at a personal level, war the warmth, but then it's the learning and them thinking. It's so strong, isn't it? Like, I mean, you, but why do you think the teachers find that hard? Do you think what what gets in the way of for, for teachers of doing this stuff? I think it's the systems we set up. Right, we have a pedagogy of compliance. It it really isn't about coaching students. It's about covering content, and then the exams, and the competition to get to the new next level. So when we look at our systems, we really have to be able to help teachers have their own communities of practice in which they can actually say, here's what I know about my students. Here's the, the curriculum that we have. And here's how I have to leverage the pedagogical knowledge that I have, the instructional tools, the instructional practices, and then put them together in a unique way that serves that class of students for the time that that teacher is going to be with them. I do think we do kind of think the path to go down is niceness. Like if I'm just nice, particularly when we start talking about students who are struggling, like, oh, if historically those students, you know, are not achieving, then my response is it's okay to kind of lower the standard, even though I say I have high standards. And then it, we, we, you know, kind of give them a pass and we over scaffold. Un not understanding that the struggle we want to put them through is for their own good. Nobody would do that to their own child. Like, I want to be your friend as a parent and, oh, you don't have to learn how to wash your own laundry, you know, and then the child's going to get to 18 and never move out. And now you're mad. Like, you <laughs> do that, right? So we're doing the same thing with our kids. They get to the end of the school year. It's like, ah, they didn't do, well, you did that. So again, how we put in productive struggle is not just be strict, it is coaching. It is mm. talking with the student about their learning moves so they can not only be metacognitive, I'm aware of my thinking, but also metastrategic because metacognitive just means I'm aware of it. it. Doesn't tell me what new moves I should employ or adopt. Right. And this is the the fallacy. Oh, our kids are thinking. They're thinking about their thinking. Well, that's not going to give them new moves. That's just going to make them thinking about their low level thinking. And we can't just be nice. It does, the opposite of nice is I've got to be strict and hard and mean and disconnected. No, it means that I have to be Mary Poppins. I love you. We're going to have a little bit of fun, but you need to level up. You need to do it. You're going to grow through some growing pains. We're going to enjoy productive struggle. So yeah, that, that I think is the biggest challenge for teachers not to go down the sentimentalist road or to overreact to inequity with, I've got to be extra nice now. No, the, the correction is we walk the path of helping students reclaim their learner identity against these social narratives and to leverage neuroscience that we're a community of learners leveling up just like we do at home in our community when we're learning hard things this is we can learn hard things together and there's a joy and a satisfaction in that that's the message teachers have to give and then create that environment do you know what it's making me think of and it's this again might be totally wrong thing. You know, a physiotherapist, a physical therapist, when they're helping somebody to walk or to learn a particular thing or to recover from something or to get better at something, it's never a beautifully comfortable experience for that person who's having the physical physical therapy. But the physiotherapist is is pushing and pushing and pushing, but still managing to be kind and be supportive but is giving that person strategies for making that next step, taking that, sometimes literally taking that next step. And everybody's aligned with what you're actually trying to do and where you're trying to go. The, the, the person who's receiving the therapy knows what they're trying to do. The person who's giving the therapy knows what they're trying to do. And there is this relationship there, but it's not a kind, nice and nice thing. Because the nice thing to do, we go, oh, sit down. I know it's going to hurt. <laughs> you know, don't bother doing this. 
but actually it's that struggle and that pushing through with those strategies so i don't know whether in my mind i'm now kind of aligning this with my understanding no. of physiotherapy <laughs> I think you're uh, on the money, Emmett, but the, I think you also have to understand that there's a source. This is called the therapeutic alliance. That that uh, uh, physical therapist was actually trained in that process. This isn't something she stumbled upon. No. <laughs> Her training said, this is how you have to do this. this is why you have to build rapport, because you're going to have to tell this person, we're going to have to stretch ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so the degree to which people understand that, and I write about that when I break that learning partnership down, that the middle part is that alliance that comes from how therapists are trained, how coaches are trained, that there is a therapeutic alliance, meaning I am here to help you. I'm going to push you into some uncomfortable spaces, but you will be safe because I'll give you some tools, but you have to build trust before the student. You can't just like show up like, okay, I'm about to push you. Like, no, you have no permission. When the student trusts you, they give you permission to push. This mm. is why niceness will backfire on you because if you're just too nice, the student doesn't trust you. Like, mm, you don't look like you have what it takes to actually get me to the other side of this. Well, You're yeah, too so, soft. And I've, I, I mean, I've coached lots of teachers where that's the issue. You know, they, it's it's sort of their, their rapport building thing has gone into that niceness groove and, it, and they're kind of like comfortable with the students, but there's not the demand. So what I love, I mean, I have to say, I mean, I I, I, I could sort of, you know, gush massively about this, but I, I really think your articulation of, the neuroscience and the cognitive science with the kind of uh, equity agenda fused with practical actions and the coaching of teachers. I, I think it's exceptional. And I, I don't, I don't think there's a, I've never heard it expressed better. It's just so, it's so many things woven together, but it's, it's so crystal clear. And then you end up, I mean, one of the things you talked about in, in the presentation I saw was about the, the class dojo, you know, the classroom, how you create a culture with talk, intellectual challenge making people think giving them time to talk and think um and being demanding of the responses they get and there's there's lots of technique in there um teachers need to learn but it's all fueled by the cultural responsiveness that you talked about earlier it's to me it's just it's magnificent so you know i, I really recommend people getting the book and and engaging with your work further because it does the path that leads you down ends with this sort of the st stuff I can do tomorrow kind of stuff, which is what teachers crave. But it comes from a place of a kind of really intense thinking and it challenges you. It's like, wow, OK, I think I've been a bit on the surface side here uh, and I, this is not good enough. And it makes you think I've got to, bet I've got to do better than this. And so it's, I want to thank you for that. I think it's really exciting. So. Thank you so much for joining us on, on the on the on the podcast. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> I know, I know. This is it's so exciting. And um we can, you know, find more time to talk. I'm working on my second book to really help teachers know how to do this, right? It's one thing to take one mm -hmm. technique, but it's like, how do I actually create this for the long haul? So I'm excited to bring more of that to folks. And I'm so excited that you found the work to be resonant and you know, just getting to to talk with others who are excited about how we bring social and cognitive neuroscience to, you know, the, the issue of creating equitable classrooms is always, um, you know, exciting and stimulating. So thank you for having me. Oh, it's okay, been a look. pleasure. I've, I've written more notes <laughs> in one podcast <laughs> than I've written for months. Thank you. No, well, I, I, you know, it, it's been re really amazing. So just so people, for people listening, you know, check out um, Ready for Rigor uh, uh, on, on, as a hashtag, on, as a at on Twitter. And also just, you know, get yourself this, this, this amazing book, um, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, and uh, follows Loretta and her future work. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone listening uh, to Mind the Gap, and we'll see you again really soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Mind the Gap. I'm Emma Turner and I've been presenting with my co-host Tom Sherrington. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review, share on social media and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on our YouTube channel, search Mind the Gap with Tom and Emma or head over to Spotify for an audio version. This podcast was produced in association with Haringey Education Partnership.
And our producer for today's episode was Luke Kemper.